Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and very nice to see you. Thank you for joining us here at the University of Denver. Uh, this is the third annual Colorado Behavioral Health Summit, and I'm very pleased to welcome you. My name is Mary Clark, and I'm the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor here at the University of Denver. The subject that we'll be addressing this evening is always important, and even more so this year, when we have witnessed uh, the uh, health challenges, mental health challenges of the last year, uh, the suicidal ideation, the opioid overdoses, and otherwise. Uh, this subject could not be more important, so I'm glad to be here uh, with you. I hope that this evening and this summit will be an opportunity for us to come together and to support one another in this important work, and I'm looking forward to the conversations. I'm not going to stand uh, between you and the conversations and the keynote that we're hosting this evening. So uh, without further pause, I would love to introduce Dr. Nancy Lorenzen, who is faculty in our biology department here at the University of Denver. Among other things, Nancy is the director of the pre-health counseling here at the university and is also directing a squad of students who are working on our COVID-19 response, one of whom is in the room. Uh, but we have no fewer than 85 or 90 students who are working in support of our COVID response, specifically as it relates to our COVID spit lab. So I'm glad to have this opportunity to thank Nancy for her leadership of that uh, opportunity, experiential opportunity for our students. So Nancy, uh, thank you and thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Provost. So one of the hallmarks of the Colorado Behavioral Health and Wellness Summit over the past years is that uh, it's free. And so uh, there are no financial barriers for people to join in the conversations and to be part of us uh, participating in this event and giving their input and feedback. Um, this is possible because of our generous sponsors and our partnerships. And um, probably you've seen that we've had uh, great support from the University of Denver, from Envision U, and, and Raleigh, which I'll talk a bit more about the um, RX Abuse Leadership Initiative. So a little bit about each of our partners. So Envision U um, was founded in 2018 to address a disproportionate impact mental health and substance use disorders have on Colorado's LGBTQ plus community. Through a statewide, multi-system approach that seeks to mitigate disparities at all levels. Acknowledging that siloed single system approaches are insufficient and unsustainable. Envision U provides LGBTQ plus specific trainings, which uh, we had today fosters a deeper understanding of the LGBTQ plus community and their needs, and advocates for and advances policies that address systemic inequities. So these efforts benefit individuals, also providers, as in the trainings I mentioned, and the behavioral health field by contributing to more equitable and positive outcomes among those they serve. The RX Abuse Leadership Initiative, or Raleigh, of Colorado is an alliance of local, state, and national partners who've come together around the shared purpose of addressing the opioid crisis. Raleigh works to educate individuals, family, and communities about prevention and early warning signs of substance misuse. Raleigh is a strong supporter of events like the Colorado Behavioral Health and Wellness Summit to help spread awareness about the importance of supporting those struggling with mental health and substance misuse in our communities. Finally, I've had the pleasure of working as a professor at the University of Denver um, for 14 years. And I'm really proud that the University of Denver is committing to raise awareness around mental health concerns and encourages our community to have an open dialogue around the issues in hope of breaking down the stigma and preventing suicides. The summit is an opportunity to engage with our DU community as well as the community at large. As I mentioned, there's no cost to attend the summit, whether you are joining us as a sponsor or in, um, or in person or online. On the screens above, please make 
Note of our sponsors, each of these organizations believes in the power of leveraging community to help um, address the mental health challenges so many of us experience. We are incredibly grateful to all of them. Now I'd like to introduce Stephen Hayden, co-chair of the summit. Stephen is the CEO of Envision You and provides direct clinical care working primarily with members of the LGBTQ plus community. Stephen. All right, good evening, everyone. So it's so wonderful to see you in person. I don't know about you, but I have been longing to get back in community with folks at events like this. I'm grateful that each of you made time tonight to join us this evening. So as Nancy mentioned, I'm Stephen Hayden. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I have the pleasure of running an, an organization called Envision You, which as Nancy mentioned, is a statewide initiative focused on improving behavioral health outcomes for members of the LGBTQ plus community. So tonight I wanna to start by thanking our steering committee, member, steady, steady, steering committee member med members, um, Dr. Jennifer Bellamy, um, professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work, Marie Hafner, who is an AmeriCorps member uh, serving um, at Envision U, uh, Zach Hyde, uh, who's a program manager with Envision U. Um, also, I'd like to thank Karen Prestia, uh, communications consultant and president of Prestige Communications. I'm also indebted to Nancy Lorenzon uh, as a co-chair of this event for her dedication and co commitment to this event. We've been working together for the last three years to, to bring this to our community. Nancy and I met in a room in January of 2019 and said, wouldn't it be great to have some kind of an event on the DU campus? So it was one of those, well, like, sure, what's it gonna look like, a half day event? And I was so grateful that the first year we had, it was a three and a half day event similar to this one, attracted more than 500 people uh, on attendance at the DU campus. And so it's grown every year since. And so thank you, Nancy. Thank you to the DU community for your support and, and collaboration. I also want to mention uh, and thank the work of Tamara Tab, who is the Conference Services Manager with the University of Denver. She's been an incredible partner and ally throughout the planning that went into this event, and I know you went above and beyond um, and, and helping make this a success. So thank you, Tamara, for partnering with us once again this year. So I also wanna add a, a note of appreciation to our sponsors because this event is really unique. Um, I don't know about m many of you, if you've attended a professional conference lately, um, they're pretty expensive, two, three, five, six, a thousand dollars to attend. And so what's really cool is because of our commitment of our sponsors, we're able to offer this at no cost, which means there's no barriers to access. It means people with lived experience, students at DU and from other universities, um, people who are practicing in the field, researchers and policymakers can all come together and engage in really robust conversations related to mental health. And it's, um, I think that's really special. And the conversations that I sit in are much more robust because the people who are being impacted by policies or the delivery of services are in those rooms having those conversations. So um, it's nice to be in a place where it's not experts and experts talking at one another, but people actually talking with one another, so I think that makes it very special. I do wanna highlight them. It's a little bit of a list you'll see above, but I do wanna point them out, so we're thankful to Anthem, Colorado Access, Colorado Crisis Services, and the Office of Behavioral Health, Colorado Health Network, Chrysalis Treatment Centers, Community Reach Center, Denver Health, Harmony Foundation, Highlands Behavioral Health, Jefferson Center for Mental Health, JSI, Kaiser Permanente, Larson Mental Health, the Mental Health Center of Denver, Mile High Behavioral Health Care, North Range Behavioral Health, Raleigh House of Hope, Stride Community Health Center, and the Health Education and Resources Institute or Theory. So please give them a round of applause. So we're also thankful to each of our presenters. We have an incredible lineup of content that will start uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m., as you'll see from the schedule uh, that's offered in the programs available, but also online. 
Uh, we have a virtual and in-person session running concurrently. Uh, for those that are on campus, the in-person uh, class uh, presentations will be in the room adjacent to us. If you're here and you wanna engage with the virtual, we'll have that set up here. So you are able to participate as part of the community in the workshops that are being delivered virtually. So I'm glad we can offer this hybrid event. Um, it's allowing us to engage with folks that live outside of the Denver metro area. And uh, we've got folks registered from all over the country. So it just speaks to the quality of the content that we're able to offer as part of the summit. So studies have shown that sharing difficult experiences with others results in improved health and well-being. Sharing these experiences in story form helps establish supportive bonds with other people. It also affirms positive values, reinforces lessons learned from, li from life's experiences. As a person with lived experience myself, I'm in recovery from a substance use disorder and I'm a suicide survivor. I know sharing my story has helped me in my own recovery and hopefully it offers encouragement to others to support those with similar experiences, knowing that recovery is possible. So in the following video, you will hear from Brad Rubindell, Courtney Sledge, and Zachary Tidwell, who have been profoundly impacted by mental health concerns. I was raised in a cult in Missouri. And the problem is, is when you have such a shame-based culture like that, it creates all these pockets for abuse to happen because no one will talk about it openly. So because of that, I had a, a little buffet of all the kinds of abuse that a kid can suffer. You know, emotional and spiritual abuse and verbal abuse and physical abuse and all of it. And the first time I ever came out to myself, uh, I was 17 years old. And I looked in the mirror and, and realized that I was like my cousin, that I couldn't even say the words gay, but I found this place called Exodus International that claimed that they could change your sexual orientation. And so I kind of jumped in with both feet. My journey with mental illness started when I was younger because my mom is diagnosed with mental illness, but she is currently diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I grew up a lot going to different families' houses, different friends' houses, when she would go in and out of the hospital. So I was in social services for about a year and a half, short term to long term. Um, right before that actually is my first inpatient stay when I was 12 for depression. And I really struggled in college um, just trying to balance work and school and a mental illness that I wasn't sure I had at the time. Um, so I would go up and down and I'd do really good in school and go really fast and do get a lot of stuff done and then i just crash and not feel motivated. And then when I was 20 was my second inpatient stay. And that's when they diagnosed me with bipolar type 2 disorder. And I get irritable really quick, I snap at people really fast, I tend to be aggressive or super defensive. Um, and then when I'm depressed, I don't have motivation to do anything, I stay in bed all day. I was a machine gunner in the Marines for four years and on my second deployment while I was married, um, I found out from another, a woman that I'd never heard of or met before that my wife was having an affair with her husband. Then I got in a motorcycle accident out at one of the racetracks that I used to ride at and I had a pretty severe concussion from that and everything went downhill after that. And then in March of 2019, I ended up shooting myself in the head. And I was working at Starbucks and I was making the plan to kill myself. And um, well, that day I, I actually called my brother on my lunch break and he was in Missouri and I called him specifically for the reason that he wouldn't know how to save my life. And I was starting to reach this sort of crisis moment where I had done all the work and it wasn't working. I wasn't turning straight. I didn't want to stay alive. I knew the difference between a suicide attempt and a suicide, and I wanted to die. Um, I'm really glad now that I shared that with him because getting it outside of my head finally made it real. And when I was working, the darkness in my head just parted. 
like, and all of a sudden I felt this phrase, Brad, you are not toxic, just kind of like dropped into my soul. <laughs> it just took root and like spread into every part of me, into my past and my future. And I knew in that moment that I was gonna survive. Biggest thing that helped me was the NAMI recovery support groups, just being able to relate to people and like, I do that too, or that makes sense where that comes from, or, oh, you can understand me and see what I'm going through. Um, that was one of the biggest turning points for me. Now I'm totally blind and I'm deaf in one year, so it's been a big life change. I mean, I had to learn how to do everything again. Once I got my independence back, it kind of allowed me to really start focusing on dealing with the other things. So I really think had I been able to talk to someone where I am now that had been in my position and tried to commit suicide and came out on the other side and is now dealing with it in a healthy way, that it would have led me to get some help and to accept where I'm at. I'd say talk, that's one of the big ones. The things that kept me alive both times I was suicidal was talking about it. Find people who love you. Like, Surround yourself with people who love you for who you are. Obviously, it's a part of my story, but it's also nice to be able to show a vision of you can work and you can go to school and you can do these things and still have a mental illness. Because you see so many people that are in recovery, that are living a normal life, and it gives you hope that you can get to that point too. Um, and then just once I started being in recovery, I wanted to stand up for myself and stand up for others. I ultimately had to rescue myself, but there were so many beautiful people that helped me get there or helped share their experiences so that I could see a path that I couldn't see before. But ultimately it's up to me. And now I have this backyard that is absolutely peaceful. And I can sit back there and I can feel at peace. And I was having a glass of wine and just sitting there by myself as the pets were running around. And I was like, if I had died in either of those times, I would have missed this moment. And like this moment is not I wouldn't want to miss. And I couldn't see that that was ever going to be my truth, but here I am. And I texted a few of my friends and I was just like, I'm so glad I'm still alive. I'm so glad I'm still alive because my life is worth living. So I'm grateful for the work of the National Alliance for Mental Illness, also known as uh, NAMI, and to each of the individuals who had the courage to share their story this evening. Uh, will each of you, if you feel comfortable standing. Again, I just want to say, you know, help and hope are available. Recovery is possible. And as Brad mentioned, just talk. Find somebody that, that you can trust, somebody that uh, will listen to you and, and have those meaningful conversations. And that's where the road to recovery starts. And, you know, by being here tonight, each of us have signaled to the community at large that we are um, willing to be one of those people who are willing to listen to somebody who's struggling or just needs a few minutes to, to, to have a conversation. And so it's really powerful and we can lean into uh, those conversations and be there uh, in support of people when they're struggling. So again, thank you for sharing your stories. So tonight's program is special for many reasons, including our keynote speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Paula Stone Williams is a national public speaker specializing in gender equity, LGBTQ plus inclusion, executive leadership, and American religion. As a transgender woman, Paula has been featured in the New York Times, the Denver Post, Colorado Public Radio, Huffington Post, uh, TEDx Mile High, um, on NPR, Radio New Zealand, um, and the New Scientist magazine. Her Mile High TED Talk um, on gender discrimination has been viewed by, uh, has been viewed more than 750,000 times on YouTube. Over the past two years, Paula has spoken in over 100 venues, uh, including Fortune 500 companies, 
public and private universities, state and federal government agencies, religious institutions, and nonprofit organizations. Paula holds two master's degrees and a doctor in ministry, uh, a ministry degree in pastoral care. It's really with a great deal of honor and privilege to um, welcome Dr. Paula Stone Williams to the stage. Interesting, 750,000 TED Talks is now like over 6 million. So I think that must be a pretty old uh, CV that I sent you. My apologies for that. It is so good to be back in person with people. In the last two years, I've been speaking all over the place, like in my living room, which is incredibly not satisfying. This afternoon, 1 o'clock, I spoke to thousands of employees for CBS and Viacom in my living room while the dog just sat there staring at me as if to say, really, you're going to do this again? I was so much looking forward to being here tonight with you. You know, we do live in a divided nation. I probably don't need to tell you that. We've been divided for a really long time, certainly at least since the first Europeans arrived here. It was the Dutch, the English who came first, but very shortly after them, were the Scots-Irish. The Scots-Irish had been forcibly removed from Scotland, sent to Ireland in the 17th century. And then between 1715 and 1760, they came in droves to the new colonies. They arrived first in Boston, but mm, yeah, the English really didn't want them there because they just weren't sophisticated enough. So then the Scots-Irish went on to New York, but the Dutch didn't want them because they just weren't refined enough. So then they went to Philadelphia, where finally they were accepted, because Philadelphia was a little bit more religiously tolerant than everybody else. And besides that, Governor Logan really needed them to fight the Algonquin and the Iroquois on the western frontier. And then as the country moved west, the Scots-Irish moved west, and they became the most prolific people group in the United States. And it's kind of ironic, because now it's the Scots-Irish who seem to think that they really are the real Americans. I am, in fact, Scots-Irish. After the Scots-Irish, it was the Irish who were vilified because, well, they're bringing Roman Catholicism here. And after that, it was the Italians because they were bringing Southern European sensibilities with them. And then it's the Muslims after that. And really, is this just what we do? You know, E.O. Wilson, the sociobiologist who taught at MIT and Harvard, got a couple of uh, Pulitzer Prizes. The first was in identifying that this key social unit for our species is not the nuclear family. The key social unit for the human species is, in fact, the community, the tribe. He also identified that there are nine different tribal species. He called them eusocial species, E-U-S-O-C-I-A-L. And he said, interestingly, all nine of these species have Richard Dawkins would call a selfish gene. They also have a tribal gene. They'll sacrifice themselves for the sake of the tribe. And he said with eight of these species, things have evolved exactly as you would expect. An enemy comes into the camp. The tribe unites, defeats the enemy. Some of them die, but life goes on. He said, unfortunately, the ninth eusocial species has evolved in a way that's quite unfortunate for the species and for the planet. He says, the ninth eusocial species has evolved to believe that an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive. And where no enemy exists, they create one. He says, we don't get a hold of that. We lose the species and the planet. And right now in the US, we see the most egregiously where that creation of enemies that don't exist comes from is from the desert or the fundamentalist expression of the desert religions. And the Western world has pretty much been permeated by the desert religions, the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. All three began in the desert and as such were religions of scarcity. There's not enough resources to go around. We've got to take care of our own. Fortunately, as those three religions have evolved, They've evolved a very generous spirit, at least in half of their lives. Unfortunately, in their fundamentalist forms, they remain religions of scarcity, creating enemies that don't exist. 
And here in the United States, we're most impacted by evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians decide the, the LGB population was in fact their enemy. But now that we have marriage equality as the law of the land, they've shifted to the transgender population. This year, 2021, we already have 17 laws that have been passed taking away the civil rights of transgender people, primarily transgender children, the most at-risk group in the United States. 17 laws. There's another 168 laws pending in another 30 states, including 40 laws pending in the state of Texas alone. So who's driving these laws? Well, it is true. It's Republican legislatures, but is it Republicans driving these laws? A recent Pew Research study indicates that 63% of Americans believe that transgender people should have the same civil rights as everybody else. Another interesting poll, Marist NBC poll, was a poll of Trump voters after the election in the 10 swing states. Trump voters were asked how they felt about civil rights for transgender folks, and 61% of tr Trump voters in the 10 swing states said they believe that transgender people should have the same civil rights as everybody else. So apparently it's not necessarily Republicans or conservatives who are opposed to transgender people. Who is it? It is in fact evangelical Christians, 84% of whom believe that gender is immutably determined at birth, 61% of whom believe that we've already gone far too far in providing civil rights to transgender people, and yet only 25% of whom actually know someone who is out as a transgender person. You know, I knew from the time I was three or four years of age, I was transgender. In my naivete, and I think also my white male entitlement, I thought I got to choose. I thought a gender fairy would arrive and say, well, okay, the time has come, what would it be? The gender fairy was gonna be in this blue cerulean, blue dress and with blonde hair, kind of looked like, you know, the good witch in Wizard of Oz. And somehow that didn't happen. And I started school as a boy, and I wasn't one of those transgender kids who says, well, if I can't live as a boy, I don't want to live at all. I, it's like, uh, okay, I, I don't really want to be, but I, it's okay. And so I just lived my life. I didn't hate being a boy. I just knew I wasn't one. Went to college, got married, had kids, built a career. But the call toward authenticity has all the subtlety of a smoke alarm. And eventually decisions have to be made. And so I came out as transgender and lost every single one of my jobs. I had never had a bad review. I'd been the CEO of a large religious corporation for 35 years. Started when I was five, we're gonna go with that. I was the editor at large of the National Magazine, all of the jobs gone in seven days. In all 50 states of the United States, you cannot be fired for being transgender. But of course, in all 50, you can be fired if you're transgender and you work for a religious corporation. Good to know. It's not easy being a transgender person. You know, for the last 500 years or so, we've had a myth in the Western world that we are primarily a rational and reasonable species, that we make our decisions based on the truth of things, that we trust science. I mean, this goes back to Rene Descartes and Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon probably found its apex in the British philosopher John Locke. This notion that we as a people are more committed to the truth than anything else. The problem is that's not true. As a species, we're more interested in belonging than we are in following the truth. You know that. As a species, we're more interested in belonging than we are in following the truth. You know that from your clients. My doctorate is in pastoral counseling, and we all have those absolutely wonderful people of great courage who come to us and talk about the abuse they have experienced at the hands of their family of origin. And then they also tell us how everyone else in the family is fully aware of exactly what happened, but no one is willing to join them in speaking about it because to the rest of the family members, mm, belonging to the family is more important than speaking the truth. We see it in a rather macro way in just the last two weeks as we discover that 90,000 Americans 
have died of COVID because they refused to be vaccinated. These folks have decided that they're not going to take their truth from their physician or the epidemiologists or the scientists. Instead, belonging to their tribe is more important to them than anything else. And their tribe tells them that it is in fact very dangerous, very dangerous to in fact at all take one of the vaccines that in fact the vaccines are more dangerous than the disease and now 90,000 of them have passed. We are not in fact a species primarily interested in the truth of things. We're primarily interested in belonging. I belonged to a very conservative evangelical denomination. I was the fifth generation. 6,000 churches. My father was a pastor in that denomination, and so was I. I was a national leader in the denomination. I want to probably 25 or so. I knew probably 5,000 people by name in my denomination. But then in my case, I decided that the truth was more important than belonging. And I came out as transgender and promptly lost every one of those people. I knew 5,000 people by name. Since transitioning, I've had substantive conversations with exactly three of them. Three of the 5,000. How many of my non-evangelical friends did I lose? None. Not one. How many of my clients did I lose? None, N not any. You can make of that what you will. But I knew I had to follow the truth. You know, early in life, we're busy building resume virtues. We're amassing fortunes, building kingdoms, slaying dragons. But then we come to that point in life where we realize that's just not working for us anymore. And we stop working on resume virtues, and we start thinking more about eulogy virtues. We find that we no longer look outside of ourselves for our sense of self-worth, but we look deep inside our own soul. That we have fewer friends, but deeper friendships. And we recognize that when you're called to something, sometimes you have no choice in the matter. Joseph Campbell called it, the hero's journey. It's common to every age, every language, every ethnicity, every people group. An ordinary citizen is called onto an extraordinary journey under the road of trial. And initially they reject that call because, hey, it's the road of trials. I mean, we're not stupid. Nobody willingly goes onto the road of trials. But now you're miserable because you know you've been called onto the hero's journey and you've rejected the call and Finally, a guide comes into your life, a spiritual guide, a Yoda, if you will, that gives you the courage to answer the call onto the hero's journey. And you get onto the road of trials, and sure enough, it's a road of trials. Then it gets worse. You find yourself in a deep, dark cave. It's what Dante was talking about at the beginning of the Divine Comedy when he said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. Yep, been there. It's what John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. You are utterly and completely lost. But then you find out it's okay. It's all right because, well, lost is a place too. Lost is a place too. And sometimes you have to spend some time in a place called lost before you finally are able to get out of that place. There are lessons you can learn in the place called lost. You simply cannot learn any other way. A certain wisdom that comes to you. You know, we do not gain wisdom by gaining knowledge. We gain wisdom by assimilating our suffering. It's the assimilation of suffering that gives us wisdom. It is, in fact, being willing to remain in that place called lost for as long as you need to remain there. I am right now in my life, since transitioning, definitely in the worst place of lostness that I have been. In fact, this might be one of the toughest of my entire life, grieving and mourning as I don't think I have ever grieved before. I do not like being 
in the place called Lost. But I also understand Rilke's poem, The Man Watching, and what he says at the end. Winning does not tempt that man. This is how she grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. There are lessons you learn in that place called loss. You simply can't learn any other way. And finally, finally, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And this time, it's not an oncoming train. And you find yourself back on the ordinary road of trials, which now feels like absolutely nothing, given what you've gone through. And you've learned a really important lesson. That you can live life without happiness, but you cannot live your life without meaning. You can live without happiness, but you cannot live without meaning. And so finally, you get to the Holy Grail, to the prize of great price, and even then you realize the hero's journey's not over. You have to take what you have received and bring it back as an offering, giving it to those from whom you have departed. Now here's the thing. Everyone is called onto the hero's journey. The question isn't whether you're called or not. The question is whether or not you answer the call onto the hero's journey. A lot of people spend most of their lives trying to avoid the call onto the hero's journey, and the life they fashion for themselves is really not all that rich. I mean, only 50% of themselves has to get out of bed in the morning. And when that 50% gets back in bed at night, it says to the other 50%, yeah, it probably wasn't worth it. You, were, you probably should have just stayed here. And we, we constantly just want to be safe. There's no place, of course, any safer than a cemetery. I mean, we've all been called onto the hero's journey. The question is, will you accept the call when it comes? Now, if you receive a call, and that call to you feels like a moment of great joy, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I love this. I love the call I have received. Yeah, that's not your call. <laughs> that's somebody else's your call. That's somebody else's call. Because your call, invariably, will give a two-word response, oh shit, <laughs> because it is always a call to a place we are terrified to go, but in fact a place we have every ability to get. So who is it that helped me accept the call onto the hero's journey? Oh, it's my therapist in New York. The stereotypical New York therapist, psychoanalytically trained, psychodynamic, been with her for like 110 years. And she gave me the courage to finally answer that call. And my first 48 months as Paula were not pleasant. I earned a total of $23,000 in 48 months. When I lost all of my jobs, I lost my pension, worth about three quarters of a million dollars. I had loaned the organization a half million of my own dollars. They refused to give that back to me. And then I earned $23,000 over 48 months. But then things turned around for me. I was on Colorado Matters on Colorado Public Radio, and a curator for TEDx Mile High heard that, and they invited me to speak for TEDx Mile High here in Denver, which is, in fact, one of the largest TEDx's in the world. That talk has now had over 4.3 million views. That caused me to be invited to TED itself to speak there with my son, and then be invited to speak at the TED Summit in Edinburgh, Scotland, and become a speaker's ambassador for TED, and then another for TEDx Mile High. Then I was able to get a, a contract with Simon & Schuster to write a memoir, which came out this past June, as a woman, what I learned about power, sex, and the patriarchy after I transitioned. The book's done really well. I'm on the book tour with it. I've been interviewed for feature articles in the New York Times, People Magazine, The Washington Post, and all the major TV networks. NPR, my favorite of all, though, again, was Colorado Matters, Matters here in Colorado Public Radio. It's been unbelievable. And now there's a production company in Hollywood making a television show about my life. Three seasons, 30 shows all together. Things did not work out like I imagined. They've worked out far, far better than I imagined. But here's the truth. I've been blessed. This is not how it turns out for most transgender people. I brought my white male entitlement with me when I transitioned. I knew what to do with a single opportunity and how to leverage that into another and into another. And now I've got a responsibility. I always say I've got to live a long time because there's a lot of stuff I got to make up for. 
all those years in the evangelical world, trying to change it from within. So I said, in reality, probably I was just comfortable. But we have a responsibility, a responsibility to bring about change in the environment we're in, to do our best. So when I was memorizing my talk for my first TED Talk, and I memorized all my talks for decades, I kept forgetting the last transition point. And I just kept forgetting it, and I was talking to my coach, who's the head coach for TED, who's a Boulder resident, a Briar Goldberg, and I said, Briar, I keep losing it. And she said, yeah, I don't like your transition sentence. Sleep on it, come up tomorrow morning, and give me another transition sentence, and I did. It was this, the call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the greater good. It was the sentence I needed. I used it in my second TED Talk and my third TED Talk, and it's now the dedication page of my book. The call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the greater good. When I came out, my parents disowned me. I expected that. My mother was more conservative than my fundamentalist father, and she demanded that they disown me, and my father acquiesced as he had done my entire life. That'll keep you in therapy for a while. But a couple of years after transitioning, I took a chance and called my father on his 93rd birthday. He took my call. We talked for about a half hour, and about a month later, I called him again and asked if I could come for a visit, and to my surprise, he said yes. He called back a week or two later, and much to my surprise, said my mother was going to be there as well. And that April, I spent a, a wonderful afternoon with them. It was so redemptive. And at the end of our time together, my father said something I'm never going to forget. He said, Paula, first time he called me Paula. He said, Paula, I don't understand this, but I am willing to try. My father was 93 years old, and he was willing to try. I think that's answering the call into the hero's journey. Dad died last year at 96. My mother died at 94, but I carry those memories with me. The call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the greater good. One of my favorite poet is Mary Oliver, and well, depending on the day, my favorite poem is this one, The Journey. One day you knew what you had to do and began. Well, the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Well, the whole house began to tremble, and you felt the old tug at your ankle. Mend my life, each voice cried. Mend my life. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundation, though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough in a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, as you left their voices behind, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice, a new voice, a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world. Determined to do the only thing you could do. Determined to save the only life you could save. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone Williams, for joining us and sharing your powerful story. The next segment is a roundtable discussion with leaders in the field of behavioral health. The conversation will be moder moderated by Nancy Littleford. Nancy Littleford has a varied career with a unique depth and breadth of healthcare experience spanning more than 20 years. Her education, training, and experience in behavioral health have allowed her to be an advocate, change agent, and tireless relationship builder. Nancy has spent the, the past 12 years immersing in population and community health initiatives in a variety of roles, including disease management programs and corporate wellness, along with consulting and community health improvement projects. Joining Nancy for discussion are the following. 
Colorado State Representative, Representative Daphna Michelson Janae. Daphna Michelson Janae represents Colorado's House District 30, which stretches from northern Aurora to rural Adams County east of the Denver International Airport and back into parts of Thornton and Commerce City, where she resides in her third term. She is the chair of the Public Health and Human Services Committee and serves on the House Education and Legislative Audit Committees. Represent, Representative Michael Janae, Michelson Janae's legislative work primarily focuses on youth, particularly mental health, as well as health care access. Prior to her work in the legislature, Representative Michael, Michelson Janae worked in the nonprofit sector as an entrepreneur and author. Representative Michael Janae has an MBA from the University of Denver. Daniels College of Business and a bachelor's degree from Yeshiva University Stern College for Women. She and her husband have three children, Eitan, okay, and Gabriella Michelson and Ryan Janae, an active duty U.S. Marine. Anna uh, Bellin Visoso um, for, is director of behavioral health services at Servicio de la Raza. Anna holds a Master's of Arts degree in Counseling Psychology with a concentration in addictions. She is a licensed addiction counselor, licensed professional counselor, national certified counselor, and a certified trauma-informed care practitioner. Anna successfully completed the National Hispanic and Latino Executive Leadership and Fellowship Program through the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction and Prevention Technology Transfer Center of the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. Anna is an active member of the 988 Planning Committee in Colorado and was a co-chair of one of the subcommittees. As an immigrant who was undocumented throughout her youth, Anna is a strong advocate for underserved and underrepresented communities. She is dedicated to implementing and strengthening cultural responsive direct services programming for the Latino community. As such, Anna sits on the State of Colorado's Behavioral Health Transfer Transformational Task Force Subcommittee. Anna was a guest expert national trainer for the National Association for Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Counselors to help, or help organizations implement clinical supervision practices that were both culturally and linguistically appropriate. Dr. April Alexander, is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Professional Psychology at the University of Denver. Dr. Alexander is an associate professor um, in GSPP. And she serves as a director of the Denver First Juvenile Justice Program Project, an OJJDP grant-funded program providing evidence-based, culturally informed, and gender-sensitive trauma treatment for justice-involved girls. Her research and clinical interests include violence and victimization, human sexuality, sexual offending, and trauma-informed and culturally informed practice. She is an award-winning researcher, and her work has been published in several leading journals, including the Journal of Forensic Psychology Practice, Child Maltreatment, the Journal of Child Sexual Abuse, and Sexual Abuse. Most recently, she received the 2021 Lorraine Williams Green Award for Social Justice from Division 18, the Psychologist in Public Practice, Public Service, excuse me, of the American uh, Psychological Association. Dr. Alexander has been interviewed by numerous media outlets, including the New York Times, USA Today, and NBC Nightly News about her research and advocacy work. Dr. Stacy Friedenthal, it's an associate professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work. Dr. Uh, Friedenthal is, an, um, as I said, part of the Graduate School of Social Work and a psychotherapist and consultant in private practice. Dr. Fried, uh, Friedenthal focuses her scholarship and practice on suicide assess assessment, intervention, and prevention. She authored the book, Helping the Suicidal Person, Tips and Techniques for Professionals and she created the website Speaking of Suicide. 
Dr. Friedenthal earned her doctorate in social work at Washington University in St. Louis, and she's been on the GSSW faculty since 2005. I now like to introduce uh, Nancy Littleford as moderator. Good evening, everyone. I think I speak for us all when I say that we're kind of devastated that we have to follow up, up that act. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, that was fabulous. Good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining here in person, and thanks to those of you who are joining virtually. So glad that you're spending some time with us this evening. I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues, and look forward to speaking with you all. Starting with you, Representative Michael Saint-Germain. Ready. Wait, which oh, one am I talking yeah, I think into? You have to turn it on. Ready. Perfect. Excellent. <laughs> Lovely. That's EU education. <laughs> <laughs> Glad it came in handy. <laughs> Tell us how do you think uh, we transform our behavioral health system away from a crisis only model to a preventative approach? Wow, it sounds like somebody took my words and gave them to you for a question. <laughs> um, so part of what I've been working on since I've been in the legislature is exactly that. How, how do we get out of this crisis only model? And it has taken me a number of years, but with uh, the help of Envision You and many other organizations, this year we finally passed annual mental health wellness exams. And the, the concept behind that is, um, I mean, we might have heard of the Federal Parity Act. Parity, anybody? Parity, parity? <laughs> um, uh, it, I think it happened in 2008 or something like that. Um, uh, but we haven't actually seen parity because it's very hard to look at behavioral health care and physical health care and equate it. How do you do that? And for me, there was one simple answer. If we are expected, every single year to have an annual physical, to go over our body systems, understand how they operate and how they change and how we take care of them. Why aren't we expected every year to meet with a qualified mental health professional to talk about how our mind is growing, how our emotions are changing, how our needs for safe social and emotional spaces is different. To me, that's parity. And that doesn't exist anywhere in the United States, except for here. This year, thanks to Steve, he was there to go sign me, um, we created a law that if you provide insurance in Colorado, private insurance, in Colorado, you must offer an annual mental health wellness exam, 45 to 60 minutes with a qualified mental health provider every single year of your life from the moment that sperm hits the egg and you become a baby. Mom gets to go and not only pick a pediatrician, but pick the very first qualified mental health care provider to help you understand how to bring this child into the world and help them develop not only physically, but emotionally as well. To me, the answer is getting ahead of the problem. And I don't think anything could get ahead of the problem better than that. And we know this, right? While there might not be data on whether or not an annual mental health wellness exam is actually going to save your life, what we do know is that 100 years ago, when, by the way, there was this other, it was a global pandemic. I don't know if you've heard of those. Um, uh, people were wearing these mask things that came out. And anyway, um, it was the Spanish flu. In Colorado, we had about 300 physicians at the time, which was not enough to handle the, the need. And you only went to the doctor then if you were wealthy, very wealthy, or dying. And insurance companies actually came up with the concept of an annual physical. And that annual physical built relationships between uh, uh, patient and doctor that were almost godlike. 
How many times has your doctor told you something that you've maybe wanted to say, are you sure? I don't think that's right, but those words didn't come out of your mouth. Because there's this reverence. Well, I'm not saying you need to have that reverence with your psychologist or a psychiatrist or a social worker. You probably shouldn't. But the same concept holds true. If you learn how to care for your mental health, your emotional well-being, your social and emotional safety and security, you can also take care of that part of you in the same way as you take care of your body. And quite frankly, I'd argue you can take care of your body much better if you take care of your emotional health. Thank you. I love that it's going to be upstream to address the stigma. That's great. That's great. Dr. Alexander, this next question is for you. You currently serve as the inaugural chair of the Colorado Psychological Association's Racial Justice Task Force. Why is racial justice important in conversations about mental health? Uh, first, thank you so much for having me back. Um, I was here a year ago virtually um, and just so honored to be here. Um, I can barely remember it last year. Uh, I know it was a great conversation and great panel, but um, I think last year was a call to action for so many people in terms of having discussions around racial justice. Uh, and that included myself, uh, that as a psychologist and having this training in psychology, just reflecting and thinking about how are we accounting for racial trauma? I entered the field of psychology to specialize in trauma and work with survivors of intimate partner violence and childhood abuse. But in all my conceptualizations of trauma, never talk about racial trauma. We talk about physical abuse, sexual abuse, natural disasters, witnessing violence, but we never talked about racial trauma. And so last year when we watched the murders of Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, just thinking about the impact those incidents had on community, not just the black community, but community at large of not feeling really safe within your community. And when we see those experiences, we know that vicarious trauma happens. Uh, that women who are pregnant during a time of police violence in their neighborhoods, they actually have babies at lower birth rates. So looking at kind of intergenerational trauma and how it's impacting our communities at large. Um, so for me, I, I think probably around this time, the Colorado Psychological Association asked me, could you be our uh, inaugural uh, racial justice chair? And I said, absolutely. Um, I was tired, I was burnt out, uh, I was gassed at the protests downtown in Denver last year, uh, but knew the significance of this particular moment in recognizing the racial trauma that so many people have experienced. I love this conference uh, so much because we also talk about intersectionality, so we're not just talking about racial trauma, but that intersection of LGBTQ people who are also BIPOC. Uh, that the average life expect expectancy for a black woman, a black trans woman in the United States is age 30. <laughs> the average life expectancy for a black trans woman in the United States is age 30. Mm. Uh, that this year will break a record for the number of murders of black trans women in the United States. Um, so I thought as a part of my role, uh, especially being somebody who researches and treats trauma, we have to center racial justice in that conversation. How do we move on from this? COVID's not over, the racial injustices aren't over. Just because we stopped marching downtown doesn't mean we resolved everything. Um, so what are we doing here as a community to resolve the racial injustices that continue to be perpetuated in society? So for myself and being that racial justice chair for CPA, it is um, one, making sure we have access to culturally responsive therapists um, uh, who can help BIPOC individuals, and I know Envision U is also doing the same thing. It's also uplifting those individuals who are practicing clinicians and psychologists of color, uh, because we often don't see the work that they do when we have so many incredible people locally. And then just giving the community resources. Um, do you know about racial trauma? Do you know that it has the same impact as any other form of trauma in mental health and uh, physical health outcomes as Representative Michael just, Michelson Janae just said? Um, so my hope is one day we will have a world where we're not focusing on these racial injustices because they don't exist anymore. Thank you. Thank you for being here to take my role. My next question is for Anna, right down there. 
What are the structural and systemic barriers that impede access to behavioral health healthcare for BIPOC communities? Yeah, absolutely. Is this on? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, Honestly, I think a lot of the structural barriers that our community, and, and I'm representing the, the Latino Latinx identifying community as that is the, the population I work with, but there is just not enough funding to serve our undocumented, uninsured uh, community members. I think in our state, um, and most likely nationwide, we know that these individuals are experiencing extreme barriers accessing care often due to the lack of, of support or little support they receive as they're trying to navigate um, complex healthcare systems um, and then finding themselves being referred time after time until they're able to find the appropriate provider who may be culturally responsive, who may be a, a Spanish speaker, or who may work with their income bracket and be able to provide low cost services to them. So. I think for us as a, as a small service provider, that is definitely um, one of the, the things we see. And we also see a lack of culturally responsive and linguistically specific care um, for our BIPOC communities. Um, I think that we need more training and accountability around um, culturally responsive training, and it needs to go beyond just checking a box of, of being trained, but rather being intentional around the delivery of services that we're providing people of color in our communities. So I think, you know, in addition now with the virtual world and telehealth and, and transportation, I think most of us have probably heard that transportation and, and technology are, are barriers to, to our communities, but understanding that Telehealth did create many opportunities for individuals and community members across our state to access behavioral health services, but that we also have a huge chunk of our community members that do not have access to a device or internet or Wi-Fi, or that don't have a safe space at home in order to be able to engage in services. So those continue to be barriers for our community members to access services. And I think most importantly, and I'm sure most of us have heard this before, poverty, systemic racism, and stigma continue to be structural barriers for our people of color to access behavioral health services. And we have to understand, and I think we're headed in the right direction having these conversations, but our people of color are navigating each day through systems that were not implemented to serve them. And so until we Ha, are true with ourselves and truly understand that, then those barriers are not going to go away. Thank you for that insight and thank you to Servicio de la Raza for the hard work in that domain. Thank you. Dr. Alexander, no, I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> Greenthal, um, what do you think contributes to Colorado having the fifth highest suicide rate in the country? Um, Wow, I got my hopes up when you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, I got my hopes up when you went back to Dr. Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has said such important things and so well that um, I just wanna say what she said and what she said. <laughs> what she said. But um, yes, Colorado does have the, the uh, one of the highest suicide rates in the country and when you look at the top 10, almost all the states are in the western part of the United States. In fact, the two states that aren't have um, a disproportionately high uh, number of Native Americans, and they also have a, a very um, devastatingly high suicide rate relative to average. But this is going to sound really weird because I gave that question to be asked, and I don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer. Mm -hmm. There are different hypotheses um, ranging from the types of kind of individualists um, who are attracted to Western living in the United States, you know, rugged individualists who have firearms and um, don't ask for help 
um, or aren't inclined to ask for help. There's also evidence that living at altitude affects suicidality and that, um, and, and it's not clear whether that's a direct relationship or if it has to do also with sleep disturbance. Um, and, uh, and then of course, Colorado ranks very low in uh, mental health services. I, I think Mental Health America ranks us 47 now out of 50. 51st. Oh, oh it's, we, we went even lower. So really lower than Mississippi? 51st. Wow. OK. So you know, so all of these are important um, factors. And then there may be other factors as well that um, I, I'm certain there are other factors as well that I haven't named. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's back to you, Dr. Alexander. <laughs> Tell us about the Denver First Juvenile Justice Project. Yeah, like I said earlier, um, I actually switched my major in undergrad from animal and poultry science, mm. as does to be a veterinarian, <laughs> uh, to psychology after working at a women's center in Virginia, working with domestic violence and child abuse survivors. Um, over the years, worked with both survivors and people who per um, perpetuated uh, harm to each other. And one of the areas that I've also worked in is in the juvenile justice uh, sector. What I've learned was that girls in the juvenile justice uh, sector, 90% of them have had experiences with either physical or sexual abuse. 90%. But a lot of us were talking about the school to prison pipeline, which is these policies and procedures within the school system that are pushing our kids out of schools and into the justice system or criminal legal system. I'm just, I've discontinued saying justice system in my class, so we now call it criminal legal system because it's not justice. Mm -hmm. um, but we're now talking about the abuse to prison pipeline, uh, recognizing that so many youth in these uh, juvenile correctional facilities have also faced abuse themselves. Um, so for me, I had previously worked in Florida with a program that provides evidence-based sexual abuse treatment to juveniles and their family members and so when I moved to DU, I want to rebuild that program. Um, so I was so honored last year when we got a grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention mm -hmm. to start an evidence-based, culturally informed, gender-sensitive trauma treatment program for justice-involved girls and non-binary youth here in the Denver metro area. It's just so important for us. If we're thinking about how do we resolve crime, <laughs> which was a big question last year, do we need more police? Would more police help us feel safer and resolve the issue of crime and safety in our communities? Well, a lot of us are ambiguous about that. So can we get to the point of prevention? That's been my kind of talk uh, for years now, that I, I'm really good at intervention. I can intervene afterwards and provide these youth with treatment. But how about these youth not come into contact with the system to begin with? Uh, so my talk at TEDx Mile High with Grand Paula a few years afterwards, uh, I always call her Grand Paula instead of Paula because of her second grand, uh, TED talk with her son. Uh, but my second TED talk was, can we invest more in prevention to make sure that none of these kids come in contact with the juvenile justice system? Mm -hmm. My whole message is we can prevent violence and sexual violence. We don't invest enough money to do that. Um, that's why I've been so grateful here in Colorado to meet legislators like Representative Michael Sinjanae, who was pushing for mental health treatment, for prevention, for mental health first aid, to make sure that people have the services they need. I don't want to continue watching these videos that we saw earlier. So honored that we have these individuals be able to tell their stories, but I wish we were there for them at the start. Um, and so the Juvenile Justice Project is aiming to do that. Let's get these uh, young uh, girls and non-binary youth into treatment earlier so that they don't have to live a life of crime. They don't have to live a life of suffering. That healing does occur, recovery does happen, and that's my mission in developing this Juvenile Justice Project. Wow, exciting. Thanks for doing that. earlier this uh, new telehealth that exploded as COVID hit. How can we harness digital tools to improve access to greater health care users? Well, telehealth has been really helpful, especially here in Colorado. Um, uh, our rural parts of the state have an incredibly hard time maintaining an appropriate level or any level of behavioral health treatment options. And 
telehealth, you know, when when COVID started, everybody remember that um, before we knew the word Zoom. Um, I think the only way we knew the word Zoom was from the Mazda commercial, Zoom, Zoom, <laughs> Zoom. Um, uh, yeah, uh, notice how they changed that commercial. Anyway, um, uh, so uh, when we started at at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, the first phone calls we started receiving were actually from parents of college students coming back to Colorado whose um, uh, mental health care provider were in the state of their college mm -hmm. and they did not have authority to practice across state line. Um, first of all, one of the very first bills I worked on with CPA, with the Colorado Psychological Association, was the Psychologist Interstate Compact, mm -hmm. SIPACT which was intended to address this exact issue before we even know, knew what COVID was, but it, it wasn't there yet. You know, it wasn't, um, I don't even, it, it, it's, not, it's, not as adopt, it's not adopted as widely as it needs to be. So one of the very first things that we had to request executive orders on was to allow therapists to practice across state lines so that our college kids who were all sent home could have access to their therapy for ongoing care. Well, that started the question of, okay, well, if we're going to increase this access to telehealth, what about in the parts of the state we can't reach? Now, I still don't believe, and this is me, no science, nothing like that, that we can only have telehealth. But for now, where we have no other service options, telehealth is great. Um, I facilitated a panel at the NAMI conference yesterday. Was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. Um, and the youth answered the question, do you prefer telehealth or in-person health? And the thing that one of the young women, both uh, with lived experience, how she responded was that separation of the screen for my generation gives us the opportunity to be more truthful than we might be in person. So I think we have a lot of research to do on telehealth and how it is impacting um, not only our youth, but our adult population. And in the meantime, we are, you know, we have jumped on the telehealth bandwagon. I am very, very, very excited because House Bill 21-1258, which was one of my, um, I, every year I have a I have BHAG's Big Hairy Audacious Goal. Um, and this was my Big Hairy Audacious Goal for last year, well, I had a couple last year, um, was, how do we answer the question of the intense mental impact of COVID on our youth? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I look at it from multiple perspectives. We're putting all those kids back into school buildings where many of them are afraid to go, nervous to go, and it's a pressure cooker, and they've all been impacted by trauma. So what happens when we put all those kids in the pressure cooker, and and we're seeing it. I mean, Children's Hospital, uh, um, Children's Hospital has has an unbelievable wait for uh, mental health treatment. Uh, Colorado Springs, every single hospital on one day a couple of weeks ago, was on a mental health divert, which meant if you are were a kid having a mental health crisis anywhere in Colorado Springs, you were driving an hour and a half before you could get care and you were in crisis. So 1258 is a, um, a program, the title was Rapid, um, rapid, Res rapid Mental, I came up with it, I can't remember. Um, uh, rapid Response to mental, Youth Mental Health, I think. I can't remember, it doesn't matter. It's coming online Wednesday. And what it is, is an online platform where any school-aged child in Colorado so six to 20 something, depending if you are a student with IDD, you could be in, in 
um, school uh, till about 23. So six to about 23 school age. Doesn't matter if you go to public school, private school, no school, homeschool. Doesn't matter if you have insurance, don't have insurance, if you speak English, if you don't speak English. Um, there are only a couple of languages that are coming online at the beginning, but we have a whole bunch of languages that are going to follow. And ultimately, you as a kid can go online. Now, ideally, if you are in a safe, healthy relationship with your parents, that would be a, a way to do it. But you are allowed to consent to your own confidential care beginning at age 12 in this state. So you can go on and take that survey. And the survey might come back with, we think that you should have some access to care. And then you will get connected to access to care immediately. And this is going to be free. So it doesn't matter if you have insurance or not. And it doesn't matter if you're wealthy or abjectly poor. It does not matter. It will be free. And the reason we're doing this is because there are so many barriers to entry for kids. And some of them are money. Some of them are access. Some of them are fear. This is a try it before you buy it model. Three free sessions, no matter who you are, where you live, um, how much money you do or don't have. And it will primarily be delivered by telehealth, but there will be in-person options. And this has been set up in a most brilliant way um, with the Office of Behavioral Health and Signal Behavioral Health Network. Mm. And I, it, it launches Wednesday, um, and we need your help spreading the word to any kid you know or anybody who has kids that they should go online and be our beta testers of this program because we are building the plane while we're flying it. Well, that's great. Let's continue the conversation about access. So, Anna, you were talking about some of the challenges of serving the Latinx population. Um, let's broaden that conversation a little bit. What does academia need to do to drive equity in developing a healthcare policy? You know, right after I submitted that question, I said, well, we're going to be at DU, <laughs> and I'm a DU alumni. Why did I submit that question? <laughs> um, but all jokes aside, I think, you know, as a student of color, I was in this campus um, as I obtained my, my master's degree in counseling, and I think it's really, really important that universities, I think, across our nation truly focus on providing funding support for students of color who are interested in our field. It is no secret that we are in a workforce shortage in our state, and we need more providers in general, but especially providers of color who are able to serve our communities, right? And I think that um, as I navigated through this education system, I often learned about the needs of white, cisgender, heterosexual individuals and didn't really realize what the need was for our own communities and people of color until I was out in the professional world, right? So I think that really shifting the mindset that multiculturalism should not be learned in a textbook or a chapter of a book or as an elective class, or even as a concentration in our degrees, right? But it should really be embedded into the programming that our students are going through because we want to feel like we belong, right? And I think at the time in my cohort, there was maybe 50, 55 of us, and there was about five to seven students of color, and I think two of us identified as Latino Latinx students. And I think it was really, really difficult for me to be able to connect with some of the faculty or be able to connect with my peers because we just had completely different lived experiences. And I wanted to focus on working with people of color from the beginning, right? And other people maybe had different ideas. So I think really, really shifting focus on having a mission to perhaps ensure that there's a certain percentage of students of color in each cohort each year. And for me, a huge, huge thing is truly multiculturalism 
is inclusive of everyone. A lot of people think that multiculturalism excludes the um, dominant cultures, but it actually includes all of the cultures and focuses on our individualistic cultures, our individualistic identities and the intersections of those identities and how they impact the way we view the world, but also the way the world views us. So that's kind of my spiel on it. I, I love to you, but I will be in debt for the next, I don't know, 20 to 30 years, maybe. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> This next question is for everyone, but maybe Dr. Friedenthal, you can start us out. During the pandemic, most Coloradans reported elevated rates of stress, anxiety, and loneliness. I think everyone, is there anyone who didn't report that? What impact has the pandemic had on the people you work with? Mm -hmm. And if you wanna throw in specifically suicidality in there. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The findings so far with suicide have been rather paradoxical so far. Um, the findings, not just in the United States, but in countries around the world, um, have been that in the main, suicide rates have stayed the same or gone down mm -hmm. during COVID. But what's very um, sobering here in this country is that as suicide rates have gone down for white Americans, they've gone up significantly for black Americans. And um, it's, it's really almost like an X if you look at the lines on the graph. And so I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that remains to be determined too because we're talking about prevention and what is the converse of prevention, which is that what's happening now is laying the seeds for tremendous challenges down the road. You know, I mean, when you when you look at the challenges that our young people are having right now, I'm really worried about 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what how that's going to show up. So um, so that was just speaking more generally. I mean, specifically, I think that the people that I've worked with um, both in psychotherapy and in consultation and in teaching um, run the gamut of how they're affected. I mean, I, I've had um, I have one student who recently told me that they lost four family members to COVID, including a parent. And then I have other students who don't even know anybody who has COVID. So it's this huge spectrum of, of consequences that people are, are having. Thank you. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? I think it was mentioned earlier, but my biggest fear is um, domestic violence hotline calls and child abuse hotline calls went up during COVID-19. Um, and now we have our youth back in schools around their mandatory reporters, what's going to happen next. Um, so I've been talking to members of Congress, people at our state legislator about how are we gonna provide supports for all these people who've experienced enormous amounts of trauma. Uh, and like Dr. Friedenthal said, we're looking probably at least seven to 10 years of impact. Uh, that even though we're in this space together today, uh, COVID's not over. Uh, and the impact isn't gone. Uh, I know somebody who's lost 12 family members to COVID. Uh, so you're talking about wide generations of loss and grief uh, that people have um, currently and haven't dealt with that. We're just moving on as normal. Um, so my biggest fear in this moment is uh, what are we doing for those people who've um, experienced enormous amounts of trauma in the last two years and how are we providing supports to them? Um, so really putting the pressure on community stakeholders to make sure we have access to all the resources we need in order to help each other. Thank you. I think we're probably at time. Does anyone want to share any final thoughts on that question or anything else to wrap it up? I will share final thoughts. Um, I'm really grateful to Steve and DU and Rally and all of the of your um, other um, supporters for, for bringing this together, giving me the opportunity to sit with these amazing um, people and to um, hear your incredible keynote. This is a problem that we have to solve together. It's not going to be one legislator, one psychologist, one uh, community organizer. It's all of us in our own unique ways. And you know, we've we've been having the conversation a lot about stigma and how do we fight stigma and part of that is by telling our stories 
So huge gratitude to the participants in the, the video for sharing your stories with us. If we don't start sharing our own stories, we're never going to get there. And um, I posted my own truth on Facebook this past week. And the calls that I received from my mother, you're never going to get a job again. They're not going to vote for you. I have major depressive disorder. But guess what? I am not the only person in this room with major depressive disorder. And if we don't start showing what it looks like to be able to actually thrive with mental illness and serious mental illness at that, we're never going to make the leaps and bounds that we need to make to be able to get to the healthy society we all want to live in. So if discrimination against people with mental illness is ever going to stop, if we're ever going to really truly bring parity, and quite frankly, parity is a myth. Let's just figure out how to make mental health, health, it's health, that needs to be taken care of in exactly the same way as you take care of your body, regularly, with earnest, and in, with immediacy. And without the guilt and shame of saying, oh, I have to take, um, I have to take medicine. Listen, I take medicine for my depression. I take medicine for my high blood pressure. I take medicine for my, you know, postmenopausal pain. I'm going to take all, all those medicines. But why should I be embarrassed about the medicine about my depression? Why should I be embarrassed when I pick up, I'm on this really great new medicine, True Pellets amazing that maybe the pharmacist is going to know what that's for i don't she doesn't look at me side eyes when i pick up my medicine for migraines she doesn't look at me sideways when i pick up my medicine my genetics but we tell ourselves a story so I, I i would i would i would beg for us to you know the the substance use disorder community has the mantra recover out loud we all need to live out loud, live our truth out loud, show people what it looks like to actually function in society with oh, one medical doctor. When my grandmother generation, so every female on my father's side of the family died of cancer. When I was diagnosed with cancer, I had no idea because in that generation, they never said the word cancer out loud. We can stop this for our children's generation. We just have to talk about it in the normalcy that we talk about cancer today. for the opportunity that we all got to learn today this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate each of you for joining us tonight. A really powerful conversation, um, and so thank you. So it's easy to look in these final moments. I just want to uh, wrap up with a few thoughts. Um, so for, I think, many of us, it's easy to look at many Coloradoans with their active lifestyles and see the proverbial picture of perfect health. Unfortunately, that image, as we all know, does not provide a complete portrait. Mental health issues are rarely visible, but they have long been prevalent among the residents of this state. Before you leave tonight, I want to share several grim statistics, which I know is not always the best way to wrap up the, uh, the first night of a conference, but I think it's important to share this with you all. So according to the 2022 uh, State of Mental Health in America uh, survey that was just released uh, last week, Colorado is one of the lowest ranked states for mental health based on higher prevalence of mental illness and substance use disorders and lower access to care. 
So overall, Colorado ranks about 37th in the nation for our mental health. In terms of adult outcomes, Colorado ranks at the bottom behind every state, including the District of Columbia. So we're at the bottom. Sadly, Colorado also leads the nation when it comes to youth suicidal ideation and completion. Over the last few years, we saw nationally an increase of about 20%, 6% uh, for youth suicides in Colorado. The increase is about 54% absolutely staggering statistics. It led Children's Hospital of Colorado recently to declare a state of an emergency, a first in the 117 year history of the hospital system. Yet I will say there's one bright spot of data that came out of this new report and it reveals that the percentage of youth uh, who did not receive treatment last year actually decreased significantly. So hopefully with the bipartisan passage of House Bill 1258 this year, which provides, as Representative Daphna Michaels and Janae mentioned, um, access to free mental health screenings um, and three free visits with a mental health provider, we're gonna see these numbers decrease even more. And we're gonna start to see those numbers of young people who have lost hope, who wake up and think a better day is not ahead is in fact possible. And it's through each of us working together in community, letting these young, young people know there is hope and there's help available. Innovation in behavioral health care is key. Under the Polis administration, the new behavioral health administration is set to start operating next year. This agency will align, coordinate, and integrate state mental health and substance use programs and funding under one government entity really one of the first in the nation that will be doing something like this, so really transformational. Streamline access to service for many Coloradoans and reduce bureaucracy for providers. State officials are also looking at how do we leverage technology to advance the well-being of Coloradoans in partnerships with organizations like the National Mental Health Innovation Center, the University of Colorado. We know an effort is underway to address workforce issues that include a lack of providers, especially in mountain and rural communities, as well as, as well as those who are trained to work with disadvantaged communities, including refugees, immigrants, indigenous peoples, members of the LGBTQ community and others, including people of color. We are convinced that financial incentives encouraging behavioral health providers to undergo increased training and working with those with the greatest needs is necessary to improve outcomes while also reducing the burden on crisis services. It's not about mandates. Let's find ways to encourage people to commit to increased training because without that increased training, I can tell you as a, as a professional myself, having gone through graduate school, I did not get the training I need to work with populations that are underserved. And so it's important for any of us who are engaged in direct clinical work peer specialist, psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker. Let's commit to learning so that we can serve those in greatest need. Communities like Denver, which I feel so fortunate to live in, are leading the way with programs funded by the Caring for Denver Foundation initiative, including the uh, Support uh, Team Assisted Response Program, or STAR, managed out of the Mental Health Center of Denver, which provides person-centric mobile crisis services response to, to members in need rather than by law enforcement. We also need to continue to look at how services are delivered. Telehealth is a great option for some folks and we've talked about how that's increased access for folks this, over the last 18 months. Other benefits, I think other people would benefit from options like evening and weekend appointments, right? This idea of this traditional eight to five Monday through Friday system of care does not work. Just imagine that family who's struggling to make ends meet, who doesn't have PTO, who doesn't have a place to have their, their child um, get the kind of care they need while they go to an appointment and they have to take a bus an hour or two across town to see their therapist and then get back to work. That's not feasible, that we're asking way too much. So why not build a system that's a, built around the people we serve and not what's best for us in clinical positions. It's essential we encourage discussions about mental health among our friends and family as we destigmatize these conversations 
people are much more willing to openly talk about what they're going through and have a willingness to ask for help. I know that was true in my own case. It took many, many years for me to finally embrace the fact that I was a person struggling with a severe mental illness who had a devastating substance use disorder. And because I didn't ask for help and engage in those conversations, it led me to, to attempt to take my life. And thank God I was not successful, and I'm here today. But having those conversations is so important. A focus on regular mental health, mental wellness exams is important to help connect people to care in initial stages of behavioral health issues, which is why we strongly supported legislation sponsored by Representative Michael Sengene, Representative Larson, and Senator Fields, among others, and signed by Governor Polis to do just that. So to think we live in a state now where we can get an annual mental wellness exam and have that covered by insurance, really incredible, really grateful, and I encourage each of us to take advantage of these new opportunities. So clearly there's a lot of work to do, and thankfully each of us are committed to working together to help solve these incredibly difficult problems. And the goal, of course, is that we will save lives. Too many people die every year by suicide. And it's because of each and every one of you that we can help save lives and let the people in our community know that it's important that they go from a place of surviving because we want everyone to thrive and our work together that's possible. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and for being a part of the conference. Uh, the workshops kick off tomorrow at 9 a.m. We have an incredible lineup of content, 40 workshops delivered over three days, both in person and virtually. Hope to see all of you here throughout the week. Really appreciate your time and your commitment, and thank you.